we've talked about Jesus as the prophet, right? The word of God. We've talked about Jesus as the, the great high priest, that he is not just a prophet, he was the prophet. That he's not just a priest, but he's the priest. He is the great high priest. We talked last week about how Jesus is not just a king, but he's the king. More specifically, he's the king of kings. All right, so all of these titles are huge. They're like Marvel movie type, you know, it's like Thor, Jesus is prophet. You can hear like the echoes, you know what I'm saying? He is, he is priest. You know, he's king, light, flashes of lightning and like you're riding on a horse, you know what I'm saying? You know, or like, there we go. And uh, just <laughs> coconuts. All right. Some of you, some of you know. All right. Good. Um, but, you know, it's these big, larger-than-life uh, uh, portrayals of who Jesus is. And, and, and then we have this week. Jesus is a lamb. Oh. You know, lambs, I'm sorry, I'm not intimidated by a lamb. All right? I mean, some of them, I know they do the whole, like, the ram thing where they ram, you know, and, you know. But I'm not very intimidated by a lamb. Uh, I think out of all the weeks, this one, like, introductory-wise, just it doesn't sound very impressive. It's, it's not like giant battleships coming in and giant, you know, like this war, you know, and the lambs in the front, like trotting, you know, <laughs> wool blowing the wind. I don't know. It's just not very majestic sounding, right? And it, it's not if you don't understand what that means. If you don't understand what Jesus is the lamb means, uh, which, which a lot of people nowadays kind of struggle with these sort of things, these, how Jesus is portrayed, and, and maybe there's not a, a really good understanding of the word of God, like they know Philippians 4.13, you know what I'm saying? I could do all things. Don't, don't you know, really know what that means, but, but when it comes to like Jesus is the lamb, there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect. And so what we want to do is, is sort of to bring some understanding, some meaning to what Jesus is the lamb means. And, and Jesus comes on the scene, as, come on, y'all, he is the hero of the Bible. Christ is the center. And so he's the center of the Bible. And, and he comes on the scene, and this is how he's introduced. John chapter 1, verse 29. John the Baptist introduces him. This is his cousin. He's a prophet. He's like eating locusts and honey, and this guy's pretty wild. But he says this, behold. There's a big crowd of people. Behold. Basically, everybody take a look. Look at, look at right here. Look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. To which for us, if we're reading that in our one-year Bible and we don't know what that means, we're like, cool, verse 30. <laughs> right? Just keep moving. But what does that really mean? What is John saying? And what did it mean to the people? I think, I think one of the... Uh, one important thing to do whenever you're reading scripture is to kind of kind of put yourself in the shoes of the people who were there in the crowd listening to Jesus. Because it's not exactly what we would think in 2024. It's what did they think at that time, standing in their culture, and their context, what would they have heard? What, what would it mean to them? Have you ever heard something, somebody tells you something that just, you know, it's, it's going to change your life? It's gonna change the trajectory of your life. I remember when my, my wife said we're pregnant. More specifically, she was pregnant. But uh, yeah, I'm pregnant. And um, I'm like, oh my gosh. Like it's a reality here in front of you, you know? And I mean, so and then all of a sudden, then you have the baby, uh, you know? Like it was a really weird experience for me. Like I was the guy that almost passed out. You know, my wife's, my wife's here, contractions and like, you know, just, just doing it, man. And I'm here just like, at one point, somebody said, do you need a stool to sit down on or something? I'm like, I think I'll be okay, you know. Very emasculating. Am I right? Come on, man. Like, you ever feel just useless? There? All right, this isn't, this is not helping. We're pregnant. I'm pregnant, you know. And so it changed the course of our life, man. Just to keep moving. I had to get back on my notes there. Uh, we had some people have babies this week. Come on, Central. Yeah. Central and Portia. Well, Portia, Central was there for moral support. You know, it's just, you're doing great. You're doing great. But uh, yeah, that's congratulations. So, uh, but anyway, so, um, 
I'm pregnant, and it changed the course of our life, and it still changes the course. Are you laughing because I'm saying that I'm pregnant? Is that what's funny? I just heard it the last time. I was trying to figure out what was so funny. Oh, man. We're going to get into this message soon. But anyway... You know, it, it, there's certain times in life, certain situations you go through that just changes everything. And honestly, for the people that are standing there and they hear John the Baptist say, behold, the Lamb of God, they heard something completely different than what we just described. It was changing the course of everything. And, and the reason is, is because for every Jewish person standing there, it would have changed everything because lambs were very important in Jewish history and how they believed. Lambs represented uh, a ton of different things. A few of those is this, found in Genesis 4, where a lamb, it's the lamb that, that Abel offered. It's called, the, the, it was the firstborn of his flock. It's so funny, you know, Casey, you came up and started reading the scriptures and saying the things that you're saying. Casey was in Destin this week, you know, just on vacation, had no idea exactly what we were gonna be preaching on, but like you preached half the message, man. Well done. Well done. It happened last time? Man, you're just in tune, you know? You need to go to Destin more often, I guess, you know? But he's out. All right. Just try to go when there's not a hurricane out there, brother. You know, last two times he's gone to the beach, there's been uh, tropical storms and all kind of stuff going on. So anyway, but uh, Genesis 4, the lamb Abel offered is the firstborn of the flock. In Genesis 22, the lamb that God provided for Abraham is the substitute for Isaac. If y'all remember Abraham and Isaac, they go, it's a, it's a wild story, but, uh, but you know, instead of sacrificing Isaac, there was a lamb that was given, a ram that was given that was a substitute for Isaac. In Exodus 12, the Passover lamb's blood secured the redemption of God's people from Egypt, right? And then in Leviticus 16, the lamb pays for the sin of the people and reconciles them to God. So remember, firstborn, substitute, redemption, and reconciles, right? So when John the Baptist said that Jesus is the lamb of God, he introduced Jesus as the fulfillment of, of all these symbolic lambs, that Jesus is the firstborn. Come on, he is, the, he is the substitute. He is the redemption. He is the reconciliation between God and man. So all hemmed up in this one statement, for them in the crowd, that's what they're hearing. They've been taught this their whole life. So that's what it's, it represents. And, and basically, he's, he's saying all of the other lambs that you've heard about, all the lambs that you've sacrificed and you've, you, know, you heard of that, were, that were sacrificed, all of them were pointing to this lamb who is going to deal with the sin of the world. Not just the sin of the Jews, not just the sin of a chosen few, but the sin of the world. There's no limitation on his sacrifice, right? The sin of the world. That's what he is declaring here. So, so kind of switching gears a little bit, remember everything that we just talked about. So the author of the book of John is different than John the Baptist. Those are two different guys. But the author of the book of John is also the author of the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. And uh, it's an apocalyptic book, okay? And obviously, pretty much everybody here knows that when people read Revelation, everybody's always trying to read Revelation in order to understand uh, the timeline of the end times, and, and uh, there's tons of different ways of interpreting the book of Revelation. And for some of you, you're like, tell us right now. Tell us the answers. No, um, not today. But there's different ways of reading the book of Revelation. But essentially, it is a, revelation, it is a vision that John has on the Isle of Patmos whenever he is exiled. He has this great vision, and he writes it down, and we're actually gonna dig into a portion of, of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is referred to as the lamb 29 times. And in part of his vision, he says this, Revelation chapter five. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into, to all the earth. Are you picturing this? weird looking lamb, right? I mean, come on, let's be honest. Seven eyes. What is it? Essentially what it's, the Bible, what the vision is saying is that Jesus is all powerful and he's all knowing, right? He's, on, he's omnipresent. And uh, 
Verse seven says, and he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the lamb takes the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden, uh, each holding a, a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. I love that imagery. Your prayers matter. Anthony just said it. Your prayers go before the throne of God, all right? Full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Verse nine, and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels. He hears the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Powerful. A little bit vague in some senses though, right? But this is pointing to Jesus the, the lamb who was slain, who is worthy. Now, what we wanna do is we kinda wanna dig in with the time that we have here today, we wanna dig into two points that we see about the lamb in these verse, verses of scripture, all right? There's so much more that we could say. There always is on Sunday mornings. There's always so much more that we could say. But sometimes we say so much, it's hard to, to, to remember anything. And so we're gonna, we're gonna kinda distill it down to, to these two points today about the lamb. Number one is that the lamb of God secures our salvation. All right? Jesus secures our salvation. Jesus does this by fulfilling the roles of the lambs that we just talked about a second ago in the Old Testament, right? He fulfills those roles through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, right? So he's able to secure our salvation because of two things. Number one, because he is sinless. He is perfect. He is sinless. For the lamb to be acceptable as the sacrifice for sin, that lamb had to be perfect. Okay, if you go back in scripture and you read in Leviticus and you read about the sacrificial system, it could not just be any old lamb. You know what I'm saying? The, 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 the lamb that was kind of like, kind of mangled a little bit, you know, kind of looked kind of funky. It's like, oh yeah, well, let's just, let's eat the good ones and let's go ahead and let's go and just burn the bad ones, right? No, it was exactly the opposite. You had to bring the best lamb. You had to bring the first First fruits, right? There's this whole concept in scripture of first fruits being offered to the Lord, the firstborn having a significance. And so when it comes to the lamb, the lamb had to be perfect. No blemishes. Had to be the cream of the crop. And so Jesus was perfect. He was perfect in nature. He was sinless in nature. If he had sinned, his sacrifice was null and void. And a lot of people don't believe that Jesus was sinless. They believe that at some point in his life, he did something wrong, surely. And some to that would say, well then, hey, let's just do away with the need for him to be sinless at all. And then we start going after atonement, which we're definitely not getting fully in today, but the atonement is all wrapped up in this. Jesus was the atoning sacrifice for sin, okay? We'll touch on that here in just a moment, but you need to think about it like this. You need to think about it like if you were to go and try to get a loan from a bank and you have horrible credit or you have okay credit and you walk up and you're like, hey, I'd like to get a, you know, a loan for this. Or maybe you go to get a car, you know, and you're, and <laughs> I heard a story one time, uh, actually there's a buddy of mine who worked at this, he was selling ATVs and stuff and he, and he said, man, he said consistently people would come in there with horrible credit. He's like, barely any credit at all. And uh, <laughs> they'd run their credit in order to get like some sort of off-road thing. And he'd be like, yeah, it's not gonna work out, man. You, you can't get this. Your credit's not good enough. And they would just be like, no, 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 it's fine. I'm good for it. <laughs> totally not understanding what credit's about, right? And so, um, but anyway, if, you, if you're one of those people and your credit's really bad, you go to try to get a loan, you try to buy something like that, it ain't gonna work out, right? You need what? A cosigner. 
You need somebody to come up alongside you who's got some good credit and for them to basically put their name down and say, hey, I'm good for it because I know they ain't. <laughs> when I was 16, um, my, I had no credit and my dad was trying to help me get some credit. And so we, uh, he, he co-signed for me to get a laptop computer, an HP laptop computer. It was high dollar, 17 inch. Speakers were horrible in that thing. It was, I think it had like 512 megabytes of hard drive storage. I don't know. It was super low, man. But, uh, but guess what? I needed to build some credit because I had none. So what did I have to do? I had to borrow his because there was nothing I could do, right? Now, okay, take that and, 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 and let's, let's convert that into this conversation about Jesus being sinless, it was his perfection that made his sacrifice valuable, right? And so we rely and need and are in need of his perfect nature, his perfection to go before us because we can't in order to be the sacrificial lamb because there's no amount of effort. Being good does not all of a sudden make you righteous and make your sacrifice worthy, right? No, we had to have a sinless lamb. And so Jesus is that. The second way that, that he secures our salvation is by taking our place and paying our debt. Taking our place and paying our debt. So um, I think one of the, the most, I think the easiest example of this for us to think of is let's say that we're looking at a courtroom and there's a guilty criminal Say it's you. Say you definitely did the crime. So now it's time. The conviction is being given at this moment. And the conviction's given. You're condemned. That's it. You're wrong. You're guilty. And let's imagine that somebody comes out of the courtroom, out of the crowd, and says, hey, I got it. And they step up and they take your penalty. And then you go free. This is one of the, for me, this is one of the most humbling things of the gospel is that I deserved death, spiritual and physical death because of the sin nature that I have. A lot of people don't like this part. They, they really don't, they like to shy away from this whole thing that people are inherently bad. And they love to just go down the route that we're inherently made in the image of God, which we are, but we are corrupted with sin. But a lot of people don't like that. Theologically, they don't like that. And uh, I don't know, I find it wonderful. I find it humbling. It causes me to, uh, to, to hate spiritual pride in my life and in my heart whenever I begin to think that I am better than someone else because of, I don't know, something that I've earned or done, I'm always brought back down to my knees and says, no, Jordan, it's the mercy and the grace of God. That's it, right? That should be encouraging. It's encouraging if you're in Christ, right? But he takes our, our, our punishment and then he pays our debt a debt that we could not owe. And many of you guys, y'all have heard what I'm saying today a thousand times. And, and you know, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you guys. Sometimes whenever I prepare sermons and I am, I am sharing foundational things about the gospel, I fear that sometimes people are bored with it. I really do. Like when I start saying a sentence and you already know the rest of it, and I wonder if in that moment we're sort of kind of, we kind of click out. We're like, oh yeah, I know the cross, the blood, the, the debt, I, I get all that. We kind of click over in Sunday school mode. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like I remember the flannel graphs and all that kind of stuff. And we sort, and, and to be honest with you, we talked about revelation earlier, like having a revelation. A revelation of what we're talking about right now, it never gets old. The revelation of the gospel is renewed when you read the word. The revelation of the gospel is renewed whenever you sin and you, and you, you, you repent and you confess your sin to the Lord and you're reminded of what we're talking about right now. Continually, 
every day of your life. And there's gratitude and there's, there's gratefulness for what God has done. This is the gospel, right? So he pays our debt by giving his life. First Peter chapter one kind of summarizes everything that we just talked about. He says, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers. You inherited your futile ways. It's not just sins of commission, things that you have done. It's literally we're born into this thing. We've inherited these futile ways. We've inherited this nature. And you were ransomed not with perishable things like silver or gold. You were not ransomed with, with cash, Right? You're not ransomed with your effort and your actions, but with the precious blood of Christ, the, the priceless blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. One thing I want you guys to, to do as you read scripture is I want you to realize how many times Paul and Peter and the other authors of New Testament uh, books of the Bible are tying in the Old Testament into the New Testament. Because what they're having to do is they're having to talk to Jews who have been raised up with this Old Testament thinking, and they're continually pointing to how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law and prophets. And so that statement that Peter just made, he's saying, Jesus is the lamb. Okay, Leviticus, all of you guys remembered it whenever you were a kid, and you had to recite all this stuff, right? Like, like, Jesus is that. Every time that you see the lamb, he's that lamb. He is the perfect spotless lamb because he's the Messiah. He's the king. He's the priest. Scripture's constantly pointing to Jesus, so, all right? So now, now the second thing, the second thing that the lamb of God is, and we read this in, in Revelation, the lamb of God is worthy, He's worthy. Okay, worth or worthy, it speaks to intrinsic value, not perceived value. You know, a lot of times, you ever watch those antique shows? I watch them once every decade. But, um, <laughs> you know, what's the, what's the old show where you got the two people, they're talking, they're like an antique show? And it's Roadshow. Okay, there you go. That was a, <laughs> that was a complicated name. What's that antique show that's on the road? Oh, why don't we call it the Antique Road Show? <laughs> anyway, all right. So, uh, you know, they're standing there, and I love the ones where somebody walks up, and they have, a, I don't know, a ring or a piece of pottery. You know what I'm talking about. And they're standing there, and they're just kind of holding it. Like, I don't, man, my grandpa gave this to me, and uh, not really, I don't, I don't, it's just been handed down. And, and then you've got that, you know, that antique person. They've always got, like, thick glasses, you know, they're like... Let me, uh, let me look at this right here. <gasps> you don't know what you got here, man. Right? And, and, and I love whenever they, they, they start explaining it. This comes from the 16th century of the blah, 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 blah. And they're like, you know, they're saying all this stuff. And you know what this person right here is thinking? Come on, y'all. I'd be like them. I'm like... Yeah, man, I, okay, cool. How much is it worth, my man? <laughs> like, like, dude, I mean, you're saying a lot of words, but man, I don't, all those people are dead, man. Like, I mean, cash, what are we talking about? And then, and then it's the moment where they're like, this is worth $250,000 or something like that. And the person's like, ah! And we think that they're excited because of the value of the historical piece of art they don't have them, but they don't even care, man. They just found it in the attic. They're just like, I get a new house, or I'm getting that car, or we going on that trip. You know what I'm talking about? But it's the, the antique road show. What are, what are the, this person is holding this priceless or precious, you know, ring or pottery or whatever it is, but their perception of the value of that thing is not determining the intrinsic value of that thing. And so, you know, in our world, if I could kind of shift over to our world, our world views Jesus with low value, low value. He was just a man, right? He was just a prophet. He's not the prophet. He was just a prophet. He did not even exist, right? He never was resurrected. It was just a whole scheme by the disciples in order to try to manipulate the system, right? Like he is, 
our world is constantly devaluing Jesus. His life, whether he existed, his death, whether it was even worth it, like atoning for anything, his resurrection, if it even happened, his returning as just myth. Every single thing that Jesus does, the world just brings it down. And, and honestly, guys, that seeps into the body of Christ. That seeps into the church where we begin to devalue God. I'm not gonna say, Jesus, like I'm not gonna say in exactly what we say because we can say a lot of the right things. But it's in how we perceive him, how we feel about him, how we talk about him whether we really believe completely in all of these things, we just, his worth just begins to come down, deflate, right? He's, he's of infinite worth, infinite value. In verse nine, it says that he is worthy to open the scroll. What does that mean? Right? How many of you, be honest, whenever you have read open the scroll, you're like, huh? Huh? Right? It's just, what, is, what are we talking about? Those of you who didn't raise your hand, like, impressive. You've never done that before? All right. I know completely what the scroll means. It represents many things, actually. Scholars lost the true meaning years ago, but. <laughs> what does it mean? He is worthy to open the scroll. All right. It's... Uh, as, as, I was, as I was kind of working through this, I'm like, okay, how do we illustrate this? And, and there's really a couple different ways, I think, that come together to help us really understand this. All right, first, it's like someone having clearance to know something or authority to do something. Um, I always think about, like, you know, people that have, like, the card, you know, they, they go to work and they have, like, the, the lanyard that's got, like, the chip in it, you know, and they walk up. And I, I, I always love, come on, whenever you see somebody that's got that clearance card, you know, and they walk up to the door, they're just like, you know what I'm saying? They're like, and they, they, you know, they walk in the door. They're just like, sorry, guys. Can't come this far, I guess. You know? <laughs> I was, uh, I'm not going to name names or anything, but I was on a, a trip a couple years ago, and um, I'm at this facility, basically, at this, this place, and I was with somebody that, I mean, they love that little tag. You know what I'm saying? Boop. I did, too, because I was with them, and they'd be like, boop, and we'd be like, look at all the, the regular people out there. You know what I'm saying? We're walking because we got the card, you know? But there's, there's a classification. Y'all know top secret information. There's only some people that know the top secret information, which I think is always funny because we think what, we know what's really going on as regular people. <laughs> Guys, listen, whenever a president promises a lot of things and then they become president and they don't do a lot of those things, it's not always just because they didn't want to do those things. It's because then they were opened up to the real deal of what's really going on, and they're like, we can't do that. Oh. And everybody's like, you promised. And he's like, I uh, know I did, but uh, whoops. You ever think about that? Right, there's certain clearance levels. And that's what people do a lot of times to God, is they're like, God, why don't you? Why don't you? We're, we're not gonna know that. We, aren't, we don't have that type of clearance, y'all. Right, you don't, you don't have that little boop. You know what I'm saying? You don't, you don't have that card. You have to trust, which is hard for us to do, but it's, it's part of what we're talking about here. But, but he's worthy to open the scroll, that he is worthy to access something that is, is sitting there. It's a scroll. You have to think about a scroll like a title deed, a title deed to land or a house or something like that. This is speaking about authority and ownership. And essentially, it's saying that only the Lamb of God who's been slain has the authority and the ownership to actually take that scroll and open up to read the contents and then to kind of sort of enact the things that are in that scroll. There was only one. And John's heart is broken whenever he's writing this vision because he says they're looking all throughout heaven. There was no one who was worthy to open the scroll. And there was only one that was found, and it was the lamb who looked as if he had been slain. Why? Because he had been slain. It was Jesus. And his death, in, in, in just like the upside-down kingdom always works, his death, even though the enemy thought that he had overcome through the death of the lamb, it was the plan the whole time. It was the plan the whole time. But, but, but Satan's too dumb to understand that. Because he's like, 
Like it's all about winning. It's all about victory. It's all about you know authority and 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 establishing a kingdom like mine, Satan wise, right? And Jesus is like, no, nah. it's like judo. You're using somebody else's uh, momentum against them. It's the ultimate judo toss. It feels a little bit simplistic to say that, but right? Jesus overcame through his death, but he was worthy. He was the only one who was worthy to do that. This, this title deed, you have to realize that Satan acquired this title deed in the fall. Sin was not just about actions and our actions. It was about ownership. It was about authority. And so through Jesus' death, he buys, buys this title deed back. Now, Satan can and will try to deceive you into thinking that you don't need the lamb, that your own righteousness is all that you need. And I think that he does this in two ways. I think that the enemy seeks to deceive you and tell you that, number one, you're not worthy to receive grace or mercy to cover your sin because you've gone too far and you've done too much, or He'll seek to deceive you that only you are worthy. Your thoughts, your actions, your ability, your intellect. I think that karma falls over here into this right here, into this side, which is if I do enough, if I'm good enough, I will somehow, some way be worthy of the grace of God. That's not the gospel. Or maybe to go to the good place after I die If I'm good, I will go to the good place. And if I'm bad, I go to the bad place. So I'm nice to people. I don't murder. (laughs) We set the bar real high, right? (laughs) I haven't murdered anyone lately. (laughs) You know, it's like, that's how we think because we are sinful and we're transactional. And that's usually where it stops with a lot of people. I don't need the sacrifice I don't need the worthy sacrifice over here because I've got my own worth and value that will do enough. And it always falls short. Is this encouraging anybody? You guys, you guys hanging with me? Anybody being encouraged? Jesus has the sole authority and the divine right to, to open the scroll, to be the sacrifice. He alone is worthy There's a song that we sing, spoiler alert, we're gonna sing it at the end of the service, called Who Else? Who Else is Worthy? I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hands because you won't raise it anyway, but um, I wasn't, ah, oh, that's not, I was just joking. Whenever we sing a song like Who Else is Worthy? What's going through your mind? It's amazing whenever you tie a verse of scripture to a song like this, and then you realize, I'm singing Revelation 5 right now. Who else is worthy? And you realize that you're singing about Jesus taking back the title deed of creation, right? Establishing the kingdom of God, being the king of kings, being the Lord of lords. And it's like Casey said earlier, it, it pulls us into worship. It pulls us into adoration, You can't sing these lyrics like this. Who else is worthy? It just, if we do, there is a disconnect. Guys, I'm not, I hope this isn't coming across um, like I'm trying to demean or to mock or anything like that. That's not my heart. But I'm just saying, if I was to tell my wife, I love you. My body language and my tone is not saying that. Now, every worship is not only external, okay? Don't get me wrong on that. I understand that we could whisper, we could think, and it could, but I think y'all know what I'm trying to say here, okay? It's, it's like I'm showing that, that maybe this isn't real to me. Maybe this, there's not a lot of value. Maybe I have devalued Jesus in my life I'm the person that's standing where, there with the, the, this ring that has such value, but yet I don't understand the value. We need 
revelation of the value of Christ, right? Okay, so because of who he is, his intrinsic value, his intrinsic worth, he alone is worthy of worship and praise. He alone. And we worship the things that we value, right? We do. Every single one of us, by the way, whatever you value in life, you put more value, more worth, more time, more energy, and it is naturally exalted and lifted up in your life. It's just how your thoughts, your time, your energy, it, it becomes, it can become the golden calf that the Israelites, right, right, Aaron, he says, well, we just threw the gold in the fire and boom, a calf came out. Sometimes we think about life like that. I don't know what happened to my marriage. I don't know what happened to, to you know, my, my worship of God. I don't know what happened. It's like, well, day by day, you, you didn't know you were unintentionally fashioning, forming a golden calf in your life. And then you begin to bow down to that thing. You didn't know it because it doesn't look like the Old Testament whenever they would dance around the calf, right? It doesn't look like that. It just looks like, it just looks like internal worship, value, time, energy, focus on something other than Christ. Now we have to think and we have to live life, but there is a place of value and worth and priority in our life that only God is supposed to live in. Fill that space. And most of us know deep in our, our hearts whenever that is not happening. We do, you know? He is of, worth, he is of uh, infinite worth. He's worthy of worship and praise. The enemy seeks to distract us from this, but that's why the final image in Revelation 5, verse 12 is a, is, it's a scene of worship and praise. Verse 12, they say with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. He is worthy of things. Basically, because of Jesus and his intrinsic value, he deserves recognition for all of these attributes that he alone possesses. It's powerful. He alone possesses these things. He is truth. He is worthy. He is faithful. He is good. He is full of power. And we submit ourselves to him because he is, right? Come on, he's the prophet. He's the priest. He's the king and he's the lamb. And he's who we worship, amen? Come on, let's stand to our feet. The band's gonna come up. And what we want to do is, is position ourselves to worship the lamb, to sing worthy is the lamb. Some of you, whenever we begin to talk about how the world seeps into our heart, seeps into our mind, the world system, the world's values, and begins to devalue who Jesus is, that really hit you. Because you realize that through the, the things that you watch and listen to and the people that you hang around, you can sense a devaluing of Christ, of, of, of his presence, of a desire to even know him. And it, and it just keeps coming down. And the thing that you say is, well, I, st I still believe in Jesus. I, man, I still believe in Jesus. Yeah, I believe in all that. I just, you know, I'm just not like crazy about it. Like I'm not, I'm not like hyper-religious. And I just wanna challenge that. Loving Jesus, living a life of sacrifice is not being hyper-religious, it's, it's being a Christian, right? Like prayer is not just what religious people do, it's what believers do, it's what Jesus did and is still doing prioritizing uh, being with the people of God in your life is not, is not something that's just sort of extra. It's, it's part of what it means to be a believer, that you desire to be around other believers. You desire to commune, to live in covenant with the body of Christ, right? So whenever we begin to feel pulled away from those things, it doesn't mean that that pulling is okay. It doesn't mean that that pulling is to just be accepted and be like, oh, well, I'll just pick it up on the next go around. 
you know? January 1st is coming. I got some New Year's resolutions I can put into play, you know what I'm saying? Then I'll start all over. No, 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 we are called to live a life of worship continually. 